So hi, I'm uh, Maxime. I work in the networking team at Red Hat. I mainly contribute to DPDK, where I maintain the VOST user library and the Vertex driver. And uh, Adrian, who is uh, joining soon, uh, has been mainly working recently on VDPA enablement in Kubernetes. So I will start this presentation by introducing Vertio and VDPA technologies and provide an overview of the Canal VDPA framework. Then Adrian will present how VDPA support is being enabled into Kubernetes, which will include an end-to-end -end demonstration. Finally, uh, we will provide an update on the current status. And if time permits, uh, we will answer to any uh, question you will have. So the Vertio is, a, is an open specification that standardizes a different type of interfaces for virtual machines. It uh, defines uh, the layout of the device and all the interaction that happens between a device and its driver. First, Vertio has a notion of features which are negotiated between the device and the driver to enable backward compatibility. Features can either be generic to all device types, like for example, uh, features about ring layout or uh, IO MMU support, or features can be uh, specific to a device type, like in the case of virtual net devices, uh, the MTU feature, for example. The specification also defines the notion of virt queues, which are the rings that are used to exchange data between the device and its driver. And finally, there is the notion of transport, which is mainly PCI in our case, but other buses are supported like MMIO. As of uh, Vertio 1.1 revision, uh, there are 24 uh, different types of, uh, of device that, has, that are specified and each one has their own specificities. In this talk, we will only focus on Vertio PCI networking device. So here we have the, the layout of a Vertio Net PCI device. We can split it in two main parts, the control pass in red and the data pass in green. The control pass is composed of PCI bars, which include several uh, structures, such as the common config, So this is a generic structure that contains fields used uh, for the feature negotiation, uh, to specify the number of queues supported by the device, uh, where, the, where, where we can find the device status or the VIA queues addresses. Then we have also the notification related config, the device config. So this one is device type specific. So in, uh, in our case, it is called VertioNet config and um, it's filled Uh, will contain information such as the device MAC, the, the link state, or the maximum MTU. And finally, we have the ISR config, uh, which is used to uh, distinguish between uh, normal VIRT queues interrupts and device config interrupts. The VertioNet control pass is also composed of an optional control VIRT queue. Um, it is used to configure different features related to the networking device such as multi-queue, MAC address, or VLAN filtering. Then in green, uh, we have the data pass. For VertioNet, it works by queue pairs, a pair being composed of one receive queue and one transmit queue. The specification mandates at least one queue pair, but multi-queue is possible if uh, requirements are met both on the driver and the device side. Now that we have a better idea of the layout of virtual devices, let's see uh, how it is handled in software. So in this slide, we can see two possible uses of virtual net in the scope of virtualization. On the left, we have a full kernel solution where kernel virtual net uh, driver is used, providing a net dev uh, to the guest. On the host side, uh, we have the VOST backend, which implements the device handling of the data pass and it lives uh, in the kernel. In this solution, QMU handles the control pass, which is both the PCI bars and the control queue handling. It translates it into VOST kernel protocol to configure the backend. On the right side, we have um, a full uh, user space solution with DPDK, Vertical PMD. 
which is in the guest user space and TPDKV host user backend in the host user space. As in previous solution, QMU under the control path, but uh, this time transacted into the host user protocol. Both solutions have their pros and cons. Um, the, the kernel solution is a default and more generic one, while the user space solution is more specialized for use cases uh, requiring high throughput uh, and low latencies. This is uh, commonly used, for example, in NFD. But uh, in any case, uh, while these uh, software solutions have a lot of advantages by providing standardized interfaces and by providing features like, like migration, it will have a cost uh, in terms of uh, resources uh, utilization by the host. It will, uh, so it will let uh, less uh, resources to the, to the end application. Also, um, even with full user space solution, the performance will be significantly less than when assigning an SRI or VVS directly to the guest, to the guest or to the container. The question now is uh, how can we uh, improve the virtual performance while keeping uh, uh, the advantages? So the, uh, the answer is by uh, offloading virtual device handling to the hardware. There, is a, there are two ways uh, to offload Vertio net uh, handling to the hardware. First one is full Vertio offload. It means that both the data and the control pass are implemented uh, uh, in hardware, for example, in the SRI or VVF. So the, the clear advantage of, uh, of such a, a solution is, as you can see in the diagram, is the simplicity on the, on the software side. You just have to do device assignment of the Vertio device, like it is done today for regular SRI or VVS, uh, which it is usually means binding your device to VFIO and pass it to QNU. While this solution is handy from a uh, software point of view, it has several limitations. First, it means device live migration is not easily possible because the Vertio specification does not cover dirty patch tracking. Then it uh, implies that the hardware vendor must implement the virtual control pass in its hardware, which uh, might be difficult sometimes as maybe the control pass is not compatible uh, when extending an existing device implementation. And more generally, it provides less flexibility. For example, uh, let's imagine you, you find an hardware bug in the implementation of a given feature um, so you, you will have uh, no other choice uh, than implementing Quirks in the guest Vertio driver to disable it, which would break the standard driver promise. If we look at the availability of such devices, we can uh, already find it in some bare metal instance of uh, Alibaba Cloud. Uh, we can also find it in, uh, in the Bluefit 2 SmartLink from NVIDIA. The alternative solution to overcome these limitations is VDPA, which stands for Vertio Data Pass Acceleration. In this case, um, only the data pass is offloaded to the hardware, which is uh, enough to address the full software implementation limitations. The, the control pass is handled by the host thanks to a dedicated framework, which is available both in the kernel and in DPDK. But uh, in this presentation, we will only focus uh, on the kernel framework. This uh, framework kind of acts as a translator uh, between the Vertio specification control pass and the hardware NIC control pass, which is vendor specific. It aims at providing back the flexibility that we lose with full hardware uh, of solid solution um, by making it easier for the hardware designer uh, as the control pass does not have to be fully compliant with the, with the spec. It enables uh, doing live migration, either directly in hardware if the device implements a dirty patch tracking mechanism, or assisted uh, software live migration if such functionality is not supported uh, by, the, by the device. And finally, uh, in case a bug is found in the hardware design, it is possible to, to restrict features uh, either at uh, VDPA driver level 
or uh, via the QMU command line, which both live in the host, and so it lets the, the guest driver unmodified. Hardware uh, supported today in the kernel are the NVIDIA Connectix 6 uh, NIC and uh, also the blue, their Bluefield 2 devices. Uh, we also have the Intel devices that use the IFC VDPA driver and soon um, also any uh, full uh, data you offload devices I uh, listed in previous slide uh, will be supported as work is going on to, uh, to provide a Vertio VDPA driver for these devices. Um, now, uh, let's uh, have a look uh, into the details of the kernel VDPA framework architecture. The core of the framework is the VDPA bus. The goal of this virtual bus is to provide a communication protocol to connect VDPA bus drivers and VDPA devices drivers. The VDPA device drivers are registered to the VDPA bus by their parent device driver. For example, in the case of NVIDIA, uh, the MLX5 VDPA devices are registered by the MLX5 core driver. These device drivers implement a set of operations called by the VDPA bus to configure the device, such as callbacks to set and get virtual feature, callback to provide uh, VRQ addresses, uh, VRQ size, etc. This is where the translation uh, from uh, generic virtual controls into uh, vendor specific controls happen. Among the uh, available drivers, we find uh, the drivers for the devices mentioned earlier, and also a VDPA simulator. This driver is uh, software only and it's used for uh, testing purpose. Uh, basically, it loops back packets from its transmit queue to its receive queue. On the VDPA bus driver side, uh, we currently have two options. The first one is Vertionet bus driver. This uh, diagram is a bit simplified as uh, in reality, uh, this green box uh, contains a VDPA, VDPA Vertio driver that plugs to Vertio bus, on top of which you will find the regular Vertio driver driver that, uh, that, that you will really find in guest uh, kernels. So this uh, driver uh, enables uh, providing a Vertio net, a Vertio net dev uh, to the host. The other option is VHOST VDPA. Its goal is to provide a unified interface to, uh, to user space application, such as QMU or DPTK based application via the Vertio user PMP. This driver is very similar to VHOST kernel as it reuses most of its protocol, but it also adds a few protocol requests to set up things uh, that are uh, VDPA specific, like DMA mapping or Vertio Net config space configuration. Um, Adrian, do you want to, to switch to your presentation? Okay, so um, now that we know how um, VDPA works, I, um, we're going to talk about how it is integrated into uh, Kubernetes. So before we go into the details, let's ask ourselves um, why. why uh, would we want to integrate VDPA into Kubernetes? Um, isn't Virtio only about virtualization? Um, well, we see a number of use cases. Um, first, as um, Kubernetes becomes like the standard cloud orchestration technology, um, we're seeing more mixed environments where virtualized and containerized applications uh, live side by side. Uh, for those cases, VDPA can provide a unified data plane solution, uh, reducing operational complexity. Um, Kubevert is a good example of this. Um, also, VDPA can provide accelerated interfaces to um, virtualization-based container isolation technologies, um, such as um, Kata containers, for example, um, using Virtio instead of um, SRIOV in this case, 
would enable smaller kernels, uh, reducing memory footprint, boot time, and uh, attack surface. And last but not least, um, VDPA can provide accelerated yet standard secondary interfaces to CNS. That way, uh, uh, they can um, use the vendor agnostic Virtio user PMD um, and only certify their application once while keeping uh, a good performance. So let's look at this uh, use case um, uh, in more detail. So CNFs usually typically uh, use um, SRIOV interfaces to enable high-speed networking um, applications, right? Let's start from there. Um, next slide, but yeah. So this is a simplified view of an SRIOV setup. So we can see that SRIOV devices can be consumed either directly by uh, user space applications, such as uh, DPDK, um, if we use VFIO, for example, or by standard Linux applications, if we bind a NetDev driver to the VF. Um, well, that is not different to what we would expect uh, in, uh, in the VDPA case. Uh, DPDK applications uh, should be able to consume vhost VDPA devices uh, using the uh, Virtio user PMD, and standard Linux applications uh, should be able to consume Virtio Net um, network interfaces um, using the uh, kernel stack. The only difference is that there are more layers of drivers in the kernel, but uh, from the pods perspective, it's uh, it looks pretty similar. However, from the Kubernetes um, network orchestration point of view, we have found some limitations. And in order to understand them, we are going to present the Kubernetes SRIOV ecosystem in a bit more uh, detail. So first, let's introduce the key players. Um, first, we have the SRIOV network operator. Um, the operator creates VFs and binds uh, the, right driver, uh, the right drivers to them. Then we have the uh, network device plugin. Um, it discovers VFs, marks, uh, makes them available uh, to pods. And then later on, when the pod is allocated, it adds um, a device specification into the pod's OCI, rent, uh, OCI uh, spec. Um, also, it um, adds environment variables uh, pointing to the PCI address that the pod has been uh, allocated. Finally, um, uh, we need to add network information to the pod. So that is done through Multus or any other meta plugin. Um, these meta plugins allow, um, allow Kubernetes to call different CNIs for each uh, network attachment. And in this case, uh, we would use the SRIOV CNI, um, who configures the networking aspect, aspects of um, SRIOV VFs such as MAC address, VLAN, et cetera. Also, um, if it's a NetDev, um, it moves the interface into the pod's network namespace. So let's see um, these key players in a bit more detail. So first, um, we start with a node with an SRIOV capable PF. The first thing that happens is um, that the um, SRIOV operator comes in and configures this PF. It creates VFs, and it, it binds the right drivers to each VF. For example, here we will show um, um, one VF using a VFIO uh, driver and another one using the NetDev driver. Now the job of the operator is pretty much done, and it's the turn of the SRIOV network device plugin. The network device plugin is deployed on each node and configured. The configuration tells the SRIOV device plugin how to arrange SRIOV resources into pools. Um, for instance, in this slide, we can say um, VFs 0 to 3 go to pool 1 and VFs 4 to 7 go to pool 2. We can also filter based on uh, the driver that is being used or in some other properties. The device plugin discovers the devices, creates the pools, and tells Kubelet about them so that these resources can be allocated to pods. Now it's time to configure the SRIOV CNI. We do this by creating a network attachment definition. This network attachment definition um, 
in, uh, in it, we defined a secondary network um, and we can refer to an existing resource pool. So uh, for instance, um, here we can create a network called extranet1 and, um, and that requires a device from pool, for example, pool, pool one. Uh, this way, Kubelet knows that when a pod requests uh, to be attached to um, extranet one, um, it will have to allocate a, a device from pool one. So now the system is ready to create new pods. When a new pod comes in, um, the SRIOV device plugin is asked to allocate a new device. Um, the response contains information that is attached to the OCI runtime spec of the pod. This way, the pod is able to access some of the node's devices, for example, the VFIO device of our VF. So um, it adds, um, and also additionally, it adds um, the environment variables, um, specifying the PCI address of, um, of the devices that it has been allocated. So um, now it's turn to configure the, the network. This is drawn for Multus. Multus uh, first configures the default network, and then it calls the SRIOV CNI with the PCI address of the device it has to configure. So um, then the SRIOV uh, CNI can set things like the MAC address or the VLAN tag on the VF and move the NetDev interface to the pod's network namespace. Um, so now the pod uh, has a network interface called Net1. <clears throat> Finally, Multus uh, gets all the information from the CNI and uh, writes it into a uh, into the annotations of the pod, so that the container, when it starts, it can access the annotations through the downwards API. In this figure, uh, we show the use of a library called App NetUtil, um, which we'll talk about later. Um, but what it basically does is uh, parse the content of the network status annotation and um, offer um, a native API to workloads. Easy, right? It's a nice diagram. So um, we found that this approach um, has several limitations. First, uh, the pod has very limited information. The only, it only has the PCI address. Um, we need more than that for uh, for VDPA. We need to know what vhost VDPA device to use, for example. Um, also, the network status annotation does not have device information. So the pod does not know what VF is associated with what with which uh, network interface, um, ne uh, which network attachment. Um, the CNI has very little information also. And, uh, and uh, finally, VDPA provisioning has some extra steps and um, and some of the those steps actually are made may, may, might change because there are certain efforts still going on in the kernel community to uh, develop some uh, management tools so in order to solve these limitations we created the device info specification um, this spec uh, defines a way to share device information in a standardized JSON file. So uh, the file is created by the entity that creates the device. In most cases, this is the uh, device plugin. Um, Multus understands this file and adds it to the network status annotation, uh, thus binding the um, uh, network information with the device resource information and making it all available to pod, uh, to the pod to consume. Um, this spec has been hosted by the Kubernetes uh, Network Plumbing Working Group, and uh, you have the link uh, down there. Also, we have improved the uh, um, network device plugin on the CNI uh, by adding support to the device information spec, um, adding support for vhost and virtio uh, VDPA devices, and adding a new selector that can be used to um, filter uh, devices based on the VDPA driver. So the uh, new selector is called VDPA type. Um, and um, also, finally, just uh, to mention that the low-level VDPA management has been 
move to an external library uh, so that we can keep pace of uh, the work that is being done in the kernel. Um, also, we have um, improved the library that I mentioned before, uh, app NetUtil. Um, it uh, gives, it provides a native API um, to workloads uh, based on uh, C and Golang, and uh, it now supports the device um, InfoSpec and VDPA. So let's go back to our diagram. So this was um, how SRIOV device assignment worked in Kubernetes. Okay. So when we add the device info spec and um, BDPA into this, uh, it turns into this other diagram. Now the device plugin configuration tells the device plugin what kind of BDPA uh, device it has to deal with. Uh, the device plugin discovers and filters VDPA devices and adds them um, to, the, to the pools. Also, the device plugin writes the information, um, the device information into the uh, device info file. Um, and this file is then read by Maltus that, and added to the network status annotation. So, and the rest of the system behaves uh, in a similar way. So, um, Pods can access, uh, in this case, vhost BDPA char devices and um, Virtionet uh, network uh, interfaces. So this is uh, what we're going to demo now. So um, if you can play the demo for me, Maxim, please. Thanks. So um, in this demo, what we can see is um, how um, we are running on a, on a cluster. The cluster has um, essentially uh, two nodes. Both of, uh, we're, we're um, running these commands on one of the nodes. So um, uh, we're using Connectic 6 dx um, with four pre-configured, pre-created uh, VFs. Okay. Now um, we're going to inspect the um, VDPA um, devices. So the VDPA bus is very similar to other buses in the kernel. So it can be inspected through the SysFS um, API. Uh, so we can also inspect which drivers these devices are bound to uh, by just uh, using uh, this SysFS API. We see that we have uh, two devices bound to the Virtio. Uh, VDPA driver and another one, another two bound to uh, the vhost VDPA driver. Now uh, we'll inspect uh, the device uh, plugin, SRIOV device plugin config through its config map. Um, it has three pools configured, but only two will be used in the demo. Um, Basically, they make they use this new filter uh, to select the v, um, VDPA devices. So vhost VDPA devices will go to one pool, and virtio VDPA devices will go to another pool. Um, now let's um, make sure that the device plugin is running on, on uh, both nodes, and uh, that. The device plugins uh, have detected these uh, devices and have added them to Kubelet. Uh, using this command, um, we list the allocatable resources known to Kubelet. So we can see there that uh, we have our two resources. Great. So um, the device plugin uh, should have also created the device information files for us. So uh, we can we can check that because they are on uh, they should live under an unstandardized um, file system path. So we can see our four um, device info files there. We can check the content of one of them, for example, and see that it's a JSON file uh, containing the uh, necessary information um, that will be needed to consume this device. In this case, it's a AV host. Uh, IV host port. So um, 
Now we're going to configure um, the CNI. And we're going to do that by creating a network attachment definition. Um, one thing to uh, note here is that the network attachment definition is a completely standard uh, one. It has uh, no changes required to uh, support BDPA. So uh, we're configuring a VLAN tag and uh, trusted mode, et cetera. We'll um, create two of those. And now we are ready to deploy our DPDK app. The DPDK app, uh, we're going to run in this demo. It's a sample uh, DPDK application running test PMD, uh, transmitting packets, and um, also uh, test PMD receiving packets. So um, let's deploy it. And let's uh, check on the logs of um, the uh, generator and the receiving end. So we see that packets are flowing. And um, yeah, so packets are flowing from the generator. And also packets should be uh, getting into our, yeah, into the test PMD that is uh, receiving packets. So, um, we will show just uh, in a second what uh, the DPDK um, command line looks like on, on any, one, any of the nodes, um, just to show how um, AppNetUtil was able to uh, generate this uh, command line. So we see that it's using the test uh, virtual user PMD. And um, uh, again, this, um, command line was uh, generated uh, just from information uh, that was inside the pod. And uh, to verify that, uh, we can um, describe the pod and look at its annotations. So there we see that the annotations um, have the all the needed information, um, the networking and the device information nicely tied together and uh, available for the pod. So uh, we have five minutes left. So Maxim, if you want, we can uh, skip the last part of the demo, uh, which is available, uh, will be available in slides. And we can go uh, straight to the um, to the last slide in which uh, we can talk about the current status and um, next steps. So back to you, Maxime. Thierry, I'm not muted. So about the current status, so for, for the lower layers, uh, we have uh, the end-to-end -end solution, uh, which is available upstream uh, from kernel to, to both QMU or DPDK applications. But still, there, there are still some, uh, some gaps and, and work is going on to, uh, or is planned to, to address uh, these gaps. Um, there is a VDPA management tool, uh, which is um, based on DevLeap, that is being discussed upstream. There is also uh, the control virtue support uh, that I mentioned uh, in the beginning of the talk, uh, that is also being, uh, that, that, that has to be added to the kernel, and uh, when it will be done, uh, we will uh, be able to, to implement it on uh, both in QMU and what I use at PMD. And finally, on the DPDK side, uh, we will add the, the config space related request of the VIOST uh, VDPA protocol that we are missing. So it will be added in the, the VIOST user PMD. And for example, it will enable to, to get the MAC address directly from the hardware instead of passing that via the, the annotations. Right. And uh, in the Kubernetes um, uh, angle, we are uh, currently working on the SRV network operator stuff. And um, also, uh, some of the vendors are will support VDPA in shoot dev mode. So we are working on um, other CNIs, like the upcoming uh, accelerated bridge CNI, in order to support switch dev, um, switch dev cards on secondary interfaces uh, on top of which we will uh, add VDPA support. 
and also well there is uh, OpenStack uh, support um, uh, coming in and that will be it yeah so I see uh, we don't have a lot of time remaining thank you very much we also have two questions from uh, Thomas uh, one of the first question is uh, can you do the same with the with sub function instead of VF and uh, Thomas is also wondering if kata is a must for SR IOV uh, so for, for sub function so uh, so it uh, people are working on it it will be supported uh, uh, in the future yes. and for kata uh, no but that kata is not a must it's just that uh, uh, VDPA makes a lot of sense in the scope of Kata containers. Right. 